Good morning everybody, this is Jason, Colorado Mountain Man Survival. Today we're gonna go out and do a little bit of field testing on the SA Pocket Survival Kit. Um, we're out in the mountains, I'm out here with Matt. Um, we're going to try it out in this weather, all reality, if you're going to need a survival kit, it's going to be in a, a climate or a temperature like this. You're not going to really need a kit when it's nice and sunny and warm outside and everything's going right. So we're going to test it out on a day that's not so great. Um, I really struggle with this kit because first thing I'm going to do if I'm cold and I'm freezing and the weather's coming in, you know, it's not really bad right now is build a shelter. There is no sheltering making material in this guy. I've got 12 foot of, you know, cordage. I'm not sure what the weight limit is, but it's not paracord. And then I've got um, a subpar knife. It's a razor blade in all actuality. It's a ultralight backpackers cutting tool. It's not a knife, but we're gonna use it to try to gather some fire making material and build a sustainable fire or at least a small fire, get it going. Um, we're not going to build a raging fire today. We're going to use those little small uh, fire starting tablet, um, uh, the cotton ball things that are in there. I forget. Do you remember what they're called? I don't, even, I don't even know if there's yeah. a name. For okay. Them, really <laughs> so cotton yeah, they're, rope, essentially. They're, yeah, it's basically cotton rope. So we're going to use those things, and we're going to try and work on that with that fall, small ferro rod. Um, I'm a. I mentioned in my box opening video that I'm not a big fan of small ferro rods. Um, they do have a purpose, but uh, really in cold weather such as this, you start losing fine motor function in your hands and it's hard to hang on to one of those little tiny, tiny ferro rods. So um, I'm not freezing at the moment. My hands aren't super cold, but by the time we get done gathering some fire making material, who knows, it might be hard to hang on to that guy. But anyways, we're gonna get going, uh, gather some material and see at least test out the fire capabilities of the SA Pocket Survival Kit. I can put a snowball down your jacket and cool you down if you want. <laughs> That's what friends are for. Okay, so here is the knife that comes in that kit. It's not a knife. It is a razor blade. Uh, we're not going to be able to use this to cut down any big trees. Uh, I'm not going to really, no batoning or anything like that. Uh, normally, well, I have my knife with me. This is what I carry with me. Normally, we're not going to use this today. We're just going to use what they give us in this kit. Um, obviously I'm not cutting down a big tree like that, uh, so we're going to just go gather dead material that we find and break apart, and then we'll probably use this to take little shavings off to hit um, with a ferro rod or to um, build our fire up once we get the fire tablets going. But anyways, here we go. So I'll make that Matt do all the hard work. I know that's the only reason you keep me around. Yeah. Survival is a lazy man's game. I'm the lazy man. I'm gonna survive longer than him. That looks like uh, a juniper tree. Um, he might, well that's not very fibrous, but you could get some fibers out of this to uh, get you a little bit of um, kindling material. Don't need much, but that's going to be kind of dry. Um, Matt's picking up some bigger stuff here. Uh, we might see about getting some needles, some pine needles, if we can find some that are wet. You don't want to pick up the stuff off the ground really uh, when you're starting your fire initially. It's usually going to be wet. If you can find some that are on the tree up, up, in the tree off the ground, they're probably going to be better fire starting material. Um, here's a bunch of it over here. So that'll be a little bit better. Um, if you can find juniper bushes on the ground, those guys usually have a little bit of oil in them that start pretty well. But just for a small fire, um, we're gonna use this little bit that we've gathered here and see if we can't get something going. Good.
Okay, so we're, I'm just gonna start a small fire on this rock here. We're not gonna keep a, a big fire going, but I've got a little bit of material here. Um, what I'm gonna do is take some shavings off of this. We'll see how this works. So I can get kind of some curls off of here, kind of do some feather sticking, I guess, um, off of this. If you can find dry grass, you might be able to do that a little bit easier, but there's not really too much super dry out here right now. We just had a pretty good snowstorm the past few days. But you know, with, with really soft material, you see this is kinda easily getting some shavings, but I wouldn't really think it's gonna do too well on larger material. But what we're gonna do with this, we'll smash this tab down, make it kind of flat this way and then fluff this material out. Expose some of those fibers. Really, this fire making stuff is probably the only thing I find useful in this kit in a real survival situation. Um, the ferro rod, you see it's got this nice black powder coat on it. We like things to be pretty, so they put that powder coating on there. Also, it helps keep it from rusting. Uh, not much rusting happen, happening here in Colorado because it's so dry out here, but uh, you're going to need to scrape off that powder coating and get down to the metal underneath or the ferro, ferro rod that's underneath there. Um, okay, so I got a little fire going. That worked pretty well, actually. Now let's see if I can get this to stay going and how long that stuff burns. Normally what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna gather a huge amount of tinder. Wow, I just knocked it out there. That burned up pretty quick. So, cotton balls and Vaseline, something this side with, with size with cotton balls and Vaseline would probably burn for uh, two minutes. As you can see, this burned up pretty quick. Um, it didn't take very much for me to put it out. So we're gonna try this again. Let's see if I can't get this little thing to catch here. I don't think it's gonna happen. Not with what I got. You see those little tabs, there's just not enough fuel, not enough energy in it to even catch that little piece of wood on fire. Um, so, I'll try one more and see how fast this burns. I'd say maybe don't fluff the whole thing, just leave one part of it fluffed and the rest of it kind of more solid? Or do you think that would just go out? I don't know, we'll find out. So I just fluffed up just enough. It starts easy, I'll give it that. But it burns up quickly. And those are on the ground. I can grab you some of the ones out of that tree real quick too if you want. Oh, they seem to work okay. So we're gonna have to nurse this fire to get it to stay going. But I could build a sustainable fire with this, really. Um, these burn up pretty quick. So I would, I would replace these with cotton balls and Vaseline or Matt made some stuff. Um, we're gonna go ahead and ignite these 
Uh, well, actually, we'll probably wait and show you these on a separate video so you can see what we did here. But, you know, I can, I can build this fire up. I'm not going to because we don't need to build a fire right now. I just want to show you that, I don't know, what the capabilities of these little guys are. So we could start a fire with this ferro rod. Uh, again, keep in mind, I am not cold. My hands are not cold, so I'm not having a hard time hanging on to this ferro rod. If it's freezing outside and I'm losing fire and motor function in my fingers, that's going to be far more difficult than what it was right there. Okay, so the next item that we have in here is our button compass. Um, it does give us a general direction. You come up on me. It does give us a general direction, but uh, I'm I'm familiar with the area in, and it is pointing generally north. Um, if you want to get right down here on this button compass, do be aware that if you put a compass near metal, it's going to cause it to change direction. So that's any compass is gonna be like that. So don't put your compass next to your can. Otherwise you're going to get a wrong reading. It's gonna, your azimuth is gonna be way off. So make sure there's nothing around. Um, it could probably even pick up on metal in my coat if I, if I had anything in there. Um, it's not picking up on the copper in this thing, but just be aware of that on your compasses. That's nothing wrong with that compass. That's how all, all compasses are gonna be. But yeah, now I got a general bearing if I did get lost. I know that way is north, that way is south. Um, we're going to go ahead and set up a quick little snare with this guy and see how well it works. Okay, Matt's uh, unraveling that snare wire. Why he does that and why he messes with it just for a second, I'll talk about the signal mirror here really quick. So this is the mirror that comes with a kit. It's not a bad mirror. It's, as I mentioned in the previous video, it is made out of metal. Um, you're not signaling on a day like today. There is no sun. It's nice and dull and gray and brown out here. Um, there's nothing to reflect this. So in this survival situation, this guy is basically useless. Um, so... Uh, be prepared to have other signaling devices. What else could you use to signal in this environment or a day like today? Signal whistle, that'd be your number one thing. Um, if there's nobody out here, obviously nobody's gonna hear you, but they're not gonna see the reflection of your your uh, mirror even if it was a sunny day. Uh, you could use um, visual panels, bright orange or a blue color are unusual in the uh, mother nature, so you can use those for signaling. You ready to go? Sure. Yeah, okay, so Matt's got his wire ready It's about here. 11 foot. So 11 feet. You're 11 feet or my 11 feet? My 11 feet. <laughs> I'm 5 foot 7 and it's about 2 of me. So. <laughs> okay, so he's got that. I'm going to flip you around here real quick. Yeah. All right, so this is just uh, appears to be standard brass wire. Um, if I had to guess without an actual gauge on me, I'm going to guess this is about 22, maybe 24. It's definitely not 20 gauge. So it's pretty light duty, um, pretty light duty stuff. So um, normally what you're going to do with this is you're going to go ahead and take and you're going to fold some over. And you're going to twist this to lock it in. And I'm making this intentionally quite large because I'm going to do uh, what they call the snare lock on it. So I'm making sure this is well and twisted. And then what you want to do a lot of times, what people say, is you actually want to take and twist that loop you made that was bigger into approximately like a figure eight. And you can also do this with a stick if you want to be a little bit prettier, a little bit rounder, and then snap the small stick out later. So once I've got it folded like that, I then fold it back on itself again, like so. You can see that there. So essentially what that, the idea of that is, is A, it gives a, a bit more strength to that pressure point when you've got the wire going through it. So that's, that would be a weak spot where the wires are rubbing against one another when it chokes down on an animal. And then also that little loop is supposed to actually cinch down and tighten down when the animal is struggling. And then that keeps the wire from relaxing and loosening up if the animal stops struggling. Because if they stop struggling a lot of times, especially with something like maybe this is real small for a raccoon. But um, if the animal stops, relaxes, you know, is not putting tension on that wire anymore, they can kind of scratch and they can maybe get their, their paws or their feet underneath that and get the snare off their head and release themselves. So you want that to lock in if possible. 
Um, obviously, for actual snaring and trapping of animals, um, state laws and stuff would apply. A lot of places don't allow snares. Um, other places that do allow snares require certain materials and gauges, um, depending on the animal you're doing it with. But in a survival situation, what's the worst that's going to happen? You're breaking the law, and what, a SWAT team's going to drop down and pick you up and take you home? I mean, you know, three hots in the cot, it's better than being stuck out in the woods. Um, I'm also not going to cut this wire for now. Um, I'm going to run this whole length through. And why are we not cutting this wire? So we can use it later. Okay. Why else are we not cutting this wire? Uh, there's no wire cutter <laughs> in the uh, kit, which, I mean, you could you could probably, like, bash two rocks together and, and break this. Or if you were to take and pinch it and fold it repeatedly, you could probably stress this metal out. Yeah, the wire is uh, definitely thin enough that you could just bend it back and forth rapidly, and it would break in half. Okay. And there's probably, what, do you think there's enough there to make two, three snares? Uh, that would depend on the animal you're going for. I would not try to catch anything bigger than like squirrels and rabbits with this. You're so not, how many not how many traps do you think you could practically get um, out of that? So a rabbit snare for cottontail and everything is usually only about four to five inches on the loop. And then however much line you've got going around, you don't need a lot, a lot of line, uh, you know, a lot of wire to go off to something else. You can stake this down right next to the trail. So you could probably get a usable snare out of a foot and a half, maybe 18 inches or so. So you might get what, eight? Yeah, eight or nine, depending eight or nine traps if you're out really of that. careful with your material. But I did forget a step, actually. Um, as you can kind of see, the, mem the wire does have a memory to it. Um, and so you want usually your stuff to be as smooth as possible. So I'm actually going to come over here and just find a stick or a branch or something like that. I'm going to loop around. And I'm going to, I'm not putting a lot of pressure on this, but I'm just going to run the wire back and forth. And that takes all those kinks and stuff out because kinks are also a weak spot. And... If you got a lot of wibble wobble in your wire, it's going to interfere with the, the movement of your snare. So and you can see that actually makes more of a nice round curl. Oops, it's got to untangle on itself. More of a nice round curl versus this jingly jangly stuff on the other thing that I didn't, uh, other part I didn't mess with. So. so you can see, like he's saying, that's, it's kind of, the wire's kind of smooth right there where he stretched it out there. But we go down here further and you can kind of see those little kinks and jagged areas. Things, yeah. And also, too, this can help, especially if you're doing it against something like that's aromatic. It can help to get your scent off of the wire itself. And with, with trapping in general, you want it to blend as much as possible. You don't want the trap to often stick out. Um, there are exceptions to that rule, depending on the animal you're trying to trap, like things like uh, cats. Um, just like a domestic house cat, that's actually a good way to attract them for bait, is you can hang like a feather or a wing, or if you have like some surveyor's tape, something that's not normal, they'll, they'll be attracted to that visual interest. But oftentimes... You want the trap itself, whether it's leg hold traps or snares, to have the minimal amount of human scent uh, possible. You don't want them to be visually um, obvious. You can break that wire if you want, so you don't have to fight with it. Right, oh, you see. can't cut it? That's I'm not in the survival it, kit. Smack it. Okay, fine. <laughs> Let's get a rock. <laughs> it's cheating. It's, we're so used to having our knives, it's hard to not use them out here got a pretty sharp edge on it. Although it is a soft stone, this appears to be some kind of sandstone. So let me just get this thing, get myself unraveled again. All right. Like I said, about four or five, and I can re-straighten this as I'm putting kinks in it. Like I said, brass wire is very soft, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, if sometimes you want stuff to stretch and bend um, versus actually snapping and breaking. So let's say something like that would probably be fine. Really soft stone, so it doesn't going to cut very easily, but it's going to cause enough there damage to that wire that it will snap on you. So rest this over there so we don't lose it. Okay, straighten her out a bit. There's also something you can do, I'll, I'll try to do it on this, but this might be a little soft and small. Um, there's a thing you can do called loading your snare, which uh, if you do it right can increase the effectiveness of it. So, you run that through both loops, like so. Now if you're going to load your snare, you know, say I've got a bit of a bend in that. I didn't quite stretch, stretch it right, but what you're gonna do, like I said, you wanna avoid kinks, because any kinks are going to be resistance as that's the animal's pulling that, that through. As the animal's pulling that through there, if you've got a big kink in it, 
I will put one back here. If you got like a big wibble wobble in there like that, you know, as the animal's pulling, that's going to hit and bump and cause resistance and possibly cause the animal to shake its head or to possibly get out. You want smooth operation. So that's not going to be in our way though. So to load a snare, I'll do it this way. You're just going to slowly, you're creating a memory in the wire is what you're doing. And you want that memory to be in the closed position. So as I'm doing this, I'm not letting it bend in one spot too much. And this is real soft wire. But you want it to be almost like a spring, but instead of springing open, you want it to spring closed around the animal's neck. That, where I twist it up. And that actually is a note here too. I kind of forgot about that. You could, if you wanted to increase the strength of this wire, if the animals are bigger, you could just double the wire up. You wouldn't want to necessarily do that tight of a twist, but you could just double the wire and increase its strength and durability. But, so, kind of loading that down. And then what you're going to do is now that you've got that loaded like that, you're actually going to open it back up for the animal that you're going to be doing. So about, like I said, four to five inches for a rabbit, give or take. And the point is, if you do it right, then when the animal hits that, which I did not do that right, this wire is not as stiff as I prefer. This is also why you need to practice. Okay. So when you have the wire open, see how it wants to spring back down? Like I said, a springier wire would work better. You want that to kind of snap close a little bit. As soon as the animal touches it, ideally this would close a little bit instead of having the animal do all of the work when they stick their head through this on the trail. Because we're, we're also doing this with no engine. We're not going to be doing a spring pole that would pull this up, which also would be a good idea if you have more of a weak material or a natural snare. You don't want the animal to be able to chew that off. You want to put some tension on that, but we're just doing a simple uh, set snare. But so when the animal sticks their head through and then hits this with their chest, you want that to kind of pull closed on them. And so then as they pull, this gets tighter and tighter and tighter around their neck. You want me to go ahead and pull this one all the way tight? See if that block Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to... It's your hand. Well, I'm not worried about my hand. <laughs> but, uh, I'm so not worried about we'll, your hand we'll either. We'll see if that locking loop right there will actually tighten up. So as the animal pulls, that wire is going to supposedly, hopefully, tighten up as it's doing there and lock in. And now see, I can actually let go, and there's no tension on anything, and that has locked around my hand as it would around the neck or appendage of an animal. You see right there, that, that loop that he made earlier tightened and pinched in on his hand. Yeah. All right, so let's go ahead and sit that guy up so they know how to sit. All right. So we're not gonna actually trap anything. Matt uh, already did a run through on how to set up that wire, but right now he's, he's putting a last little finishing touches on it and then we're going to go find a, a spot that we can set it up um, we're just going to pick a, an area just to give you an idea um, of how to set it up but uh, really you need to be a little bit more um, picky about where you want to set your survival snares up if you want to actually catch something ideally you're going to walk around you're going to find a game trail some sort of animal trail you're going to tr find tracks on the ground or in the snow or whatever find a, tr a squirrel tree, a tree that the squirrels like to hang out on, um, whatever that shows sign of life. And you're going to put that snare up in that area. Um, if you have a funnel, you drive those animals into that funnel. Um, if it's in a field and you know there's a um, lot of rabbit burrows or rabbit dens out there, you're going to set them up around their dens and then you can walk that field and actually drive them back into their homes and they're gonna to want to go get away from you, but that's where your trap lays waiting. Do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, yeah, it's, it's the main thing about trapping is knowing where to set them and how to set them. That's, that's the biggest deal. Because you could, you could set 100 traps, and if you don't know where to set them or how to set them, you're not gonna catch anything, versus if you only have eight or nine traps, but you know how to set them and the location and you know how to manipulate. Trapping is manipulating the animal's behavior. Right. It's, it's you know getting the animal to go where you want it to go, to put its head where you want to put its head. So you can have a lot of success, you know, obviously if you, if you know what you're doing with, with fewer traps versus just setting them all willy-nilly all over the place. And that takes practice and uh, paying attention to your surroundings and the behaviors of animals. Um, we're not going to go into that today. It's going to take, that takes a lot of time to learn. We're just going to show you how to set up a trap. Yep. All right. Do cool. your thing. Okay. So, I mean, obviously there's not any obvious animals trails around here. We could wander around until we found some, but just to kind of show you guys what I'm talking about. 
um, you know, let's just say that this right here is an animal path. They've, they've worn a path through the brush and everything else. I'm assuming I don't want to try to cut stakes, especially because there's not really any, uh, a really valid or not a very usable cutting tool in that kit to cut like a stake to stake your trap down. I'm going to use what's around and what's natural. So I'm going to go ahead and try to just uh, watch it on this side so it's easier to see. We're going to pretend that this is an animal trail going through here for rabbit. So I've got my snare here. This is pretty sturdy. Animals, you know, the rabbit's not going to pull that out of the ground. So I'm going to go ahead and just set this here. I'm going to wrap around probably two or three times around the tree itself to stick. Twice is probably fine for this. I did cut this a little short. It's better if you can afford the material to leave more. If not, uh, you know, it's better to have some hanging off the back. But you do that, and then you're going to go ahead and pull that pretty tight. And wrapping it around the tree also serves to where it's not just one single pillar point where the trap will want to move up and down. It gives it a firmer base to attach to. I'm going to just wrap that wire around several times. Hard to do this on camera the opposite way, but move where you need to move and I'll, I'll move with you. That's all right. So you want that to wrap, wrap around at least three or four times and then more if, if you've got it. Otherwise the whole animal, they'll, they'll hop off with your whole set. So, all right. So, got that set up. Gotta move this up. Like I said, we'll go ahead and make our ring. You can see how that does kind of want to spring down a little bit. That's slightly loaded. Not ideal. I would use a different wire myself. But we're gonna go ahead and just bring this up. Set, that's about the right size. So for rabbit, you like I said, I think you want about four to five inches in diameter and then we're just, we're just stressing this wire and moving it until it kind of stays where we want it to so about like so and you usually want it about three to four inches off of the ground if possible so that would probably be about fine for rabbit my fingers are about three to four inches so be down a little bit lower about like so and what you can also do a neat little trick they call it a, a chin lift stick um, and there's variations of this to where you can actually um, keep certain animals like deer from stepping through your trap. You can actually make a step stick where you'd actually lay something across here if it's on a, a bigger path so a deer doesn't actually step on your set and break it. They'll step over and small animals will go through. But what you can do to make sure the rabbit actually gets its head through here, because ideally you always want to go for a neck snare on, on pretty much any animal. Um, what you can do is you just create like a little chin lift stick. It doesn't even have to be anything this big, maybe even something a little bit smaller. You know, animals are moving with their heads real low to the ground. So what you can do is you can take like something that's not overly beefy and you take and stick it down in the ground here under your trap. Okay, maybe pine needle is not a good idea. There's a wispier stick. Frozen ground. You're just gonna put a little stick down in. <laughs> of course I keep grabbing. <laughs> keep grabbing bad ones. Everything always happens as, here. as soon as the camera's rolling every time. But you're essentially literally just putting a little obstacle. So they're going to be less like, it didn't even have to be all the way up to the wire. It just has to be something about like so, because, you know, they're not going to understand what a wire is. To them, that looks like a, I mean, this wire is actually thinner than a pine needle. You know, so I mean, that, that just looks like a piece of grass. But you're going to put like a little chin lift stick, so they're not going to run their nose into that and try to go under your snare. It's easier for them to pick their head up and go through. But this is also still a pretty wide area. You know, you're, you're really, really hoping the animal just happens to stick its head through there. So what you need to do is you need to funnel and manipulate the animal. So you want it to still look natural, but you're going to start putting little obstructions and branches and things like that in the way to where the easiest way for them to go is right where you want them to. So you know, just put a little stick here, you know, a little stick there. And anyway, little pieces of grass, twigs, other plants, and things like that. You kind of want to just make it to where the only option and you don't want it to be a solid wall. Like I said, you want it to be natural. But it's just easier for them to go where you want them to. You know, a light little stick like right there, right next to your snare there. So they're not going to, they're very unlikely to want to try to go through something like this with all these other branches and stuff in the way. And you can also, you don't have to do this in a straight line. You can also, like we were saying, funnel. So you can actually have things coming in at a diagonal angle. But, uh, you know, kind of lay some stuff across, you know. Small animals, they're not going to want to try to run their head through a bunch of, you know, thick brush and debris. Stick it in the ground if you want. So, 
I've manipulated that now to where if an animal is going to come along, coming through, he's going to not want to go there. He's not going to want to go through here and under, or, you know, not likely anyways. More than likely, he's going to want to stick his head right through there as they're going and then pull your snare. And you see how I barely pushed on that and it closed up kind of tight? That's just closing that distance for you so they're not having to go as far. But loading the snare is not necessary. It's just a little tip that makes it, uh, that may increase your success chances. All right, so what uh, what gauge or wire would you recommend for um, a rabbit, squirrel, smaller animals? Smaller animals, you want smaller, softer wire for sure. Um, but know, 20, 20, 22 to 24 gauge, that would be probably pretty good for rabbit. Rabbit might be on the bigger end um, with possibly breaking the wire if they struggle too much. That would be great for squirrel and things like that, especially if you did like a squirrel pull. Um, so that, that would be fantastic. It's, it's hard with snares because, especially at least with like the cable snares that people use for bigger animals. And animal, animals have got a lot of power. They'll wreck um, a snare. Um, Jason can probably splice in a photo that a friend of mine that Trapp sent of what a wolverine did to an aircraft cable snare. They will destroy a snare. Um, and so that also is something to think about is even with a wire snare, it may be a one-time use item. You may not get more than one use out of that. So it's better to have enough to make quite a few of those versus like, okay, I got four snares. I'll be able to live in the woods for a week. I, I don't know if I'd, I'd cut it that close myself. It's better to have a little bit of extra weight. The wire doesn't weigh much at all. But I'd say maybe even like for larger animals, like rare rabbits and stuff, I'd probably say maybe more of like a 20 wire or 20 gauge brass. Um, there is a lot, I don't have any experience using stainless wire myself, but some people do prefer stainless. But if it's the right alloy, um, it's not as brittle. It doesn't tend to snap and break as much. Um, but I don't know if I try to use that stuff for anything bigger, you know, like a raccoon. Raccoons have got a lot of power too. So you could double the 20 gauge up, but I'd say middle of the road for small game um, would be good for, for 20 gauge to 22 gauge, probably brass is, is your, your, your go-to for, for mid-size animals, you know, or small animals, sorry, not mid-size. Okay, cool. Squirrels, so. Right on. Well, there's your basic snare setup for catching small game. Yeah. And, and don't forget to uh, check your snares and your traps often because uh, A, the animal may not have been having to dispatch itself. It may still be alive, and the longer it's alive in the trap, the more chance it is of getting away. And also, too, you're not the only one that's out here hunting trying to find food. So you may show up and find only little bits of fur and some blood where Mr. Coyote or Mr. Fox came through and said, oh, look, free meal, and they take off with your, with your meal. So always check your traps as often as possible, as long as calorie, um, you're, you're not expending too many calories to do so, and you're not also, you don't want to like stomp right up to your, your trap and disturb the animals. Um, you know, you, if you can check from a distance and kind of say, okay, I can see that trap is still set, nothing in it, leave it alone, don't disturb the animals too much. You want to try to find a balance between that, so. All right, so here's the rest of the stuff in the kit we've got. We went over the mirror, we went over the fire starter and the knife, or the razor blade, I should say. Um, the, the paracord, it's not paracord, the rope that's in here, the cordage. Um, it's hard to say what the test is. Could be 50 pounds, could be 150 pounds, could be 20 pounds. I'm not really sure what it's made out of. Uh, you could use that to um, for a splint. Um, I wouldn't use it for a tourniquet way too thin. You're going to cause more tissue damage than you're going to save unless it's the only thing available. But then you could just use your belt or a shirt or something. Um, not really good for, for a tourniquet. I'm really the biggest thing for cordage is setting up a uh, a shelter, but there's nothing in this kit to set it up a shelter with. Uh, there's no knife in there to help you cut down trees. So, um, you know, who knows what you're going to need that cordage for. Uh, the, the environment we're in, there's no use, really no, um, no fishing use for the, the fishing line. You could set up some sort of... Um, bait that hook in the line with uh, something that the squirrels are willing to eat and you could yep. possibly catch a squirrel with a fishing hook you can catch a bird well. yep. yeah or turkeys or something like that so there there is another way to uh, catch food with that um, we went over the butt, button compass that's always fun Whee. impress your kids it's magic um, now we got the uh, the signal light um, you're not going to see that from a long distance off during the day um, I'm sure it's pretty darn bright at night. Um, okay, so let's see what else do we got in here. That's it, isn't it? That's it. Uh, That's yeah, in signal that too. here, the fire. Um, so there's your kit, your pocket survival kit for Essie. 
Um, the fire starting stuff is okay. I would definitely replace this. Um, really, for $35, I could really make my own kit far better for far less money. Yeah, that's, that's probably one of the more valuable things would be this card here in the bottom. If I yeah, get it. <laughs> that's uh, basically just got some survival tips on it. It is difficult to get up out of there. Here's the cleaning cloth. I don't know where that went to. So, are you seeing any goodness on that? I mean, yep. there's... Yeah, the survival acronym. Because that, that's the biggest thing. It's, you know, even if you don't have any gear, the biggest thing is your mental attitude and yeah. remembering, you know, what to do. You know, don't make yourself get more lost and that kind of stuff. So, Honestly, uh, survival is 10% skills, 90% mental. But there's, you know, some short-term uh, survival tips and some signaling... Yep. Uh, signs, some signaling yep, distress signals, signals, distress signals. I'm like, I can't wordly today. Sorry, guys. Uh, <laughs> but there, there's the Poxy Survival Kit out in the field for cold weather. It's really not going to do too much out here for you. You can get a fire going, um, but the the tinder is not great. Um, but we'll revisit this guy when we have a warmer temperature. Maybe what when we're out in the in the mountains with this nice stream. But as far as cold weather goes, really. Not a good kit. What do you think? What are your thoughts on it as um, it sits there with your little bit of experience? It's, it's hard when you make kits this small. I mean, you know, I understand the the the, uh, the appeal of, you know, you don't want to have to carry around, you know, five to ten pounds of stuff for a survival kit. You want something you can just stick in your pocket, but you're really limiting yourself on your options and, and what you can actually accomplish, especially if you don't know what you're doing. If you don't have the training to go along with it, you know, a novice, if you just hand them a kit versus someone like us that actually knows the other uses um you know the more you know the less you carry as morse kahansky used to say um but even then something this small you're kind of you're kind of pushing it so but better than nothing absolutely i mean it, it's definitely better than nothing yeah uh, I, I struggle with that term though all righty well there's that kit um we're done testing it for today we'll take it out again like i said before and revisit this in a different climate um but the important thing is is get out there and test the gear, the gear that you buy don't just Throw it in your backpack or in your pocket and assume that it's going to be enough and it's going to have everything you need. Get out there, test it, use the stuff before you're actually in a survival situation. Otherwise, you just gave yourself um, overconfidence and something that is just not there. It's not going to be able to do for you. But uh, that's it for now. Hopefully you learned something. Thanks for joining us. If you like this video, like and subscribe. Subscribe. <laughs> Like and subscribe, share with all your friends. Uh, tell them how freaking awesome uh, Matt is over here. But uh, thanks for joining us. Hopefully you learned something. I'll see you again next time.